Oh, where to start with round 21? That might be the best round of the season so far. Narratives everywhere you look. Surprising results. Top spot lost by 112 points. It is crazy trying to isolate what was the best game this week. I reckon you have four contenders. Friday night between Eagles and Gold Coast was one of the best games of the round. Probably loses points for not being relevant to the finals race. You had Carlton and Collingwood. Geelong and Adelaide was five points. GWS and Hawthorne. And then probably the best game of the lot, I think, was Essendon versus Fremantle. So we're going to get straight into round 21. There's a heap of comments this week. I got 52, I think, and I couldn't possibly fit them all in. So apologies for that. We're going to unpack the round game by game and get through some comments. So we'll start with some general comments. There's a lot to talk about here. Amusement Production says, The game is not ruined. The whole AFL community needs to accept some deficiencies in the game and appreciate an amazing product. Side note, Bontempelli goes all right. I agree that the game's not ruined. I mean, that was an enthralling round. So, I mean, everyone's still pretty engaged with football. I suppose where the teething issues are, it feels like a very transitional period for the AFL at the moment with respect to, you know, head injuries and concussion. You know, I feel like we're going through an awkward time with that. We're still learning what's the best way to adjudicate it. And I think like quite often we get that wrong. So hopefully that's just a temporary thing. You've got this whole academy thing going on in the draft with rule changes and we're still trying to work out how to get through that. So I'd agree the game's not ruined, although it does produce some weird outcomes and hopefully these things will be temporary. Holding the ball is also a mess in my opinion. However, let's move on. Max Hansen says the two largest losses this year will probably go to the minor premiers and the wooden spooners richmond lost by 119 swans lost by 112 yes west coast is not on the list i reckon we comfortably had the worst loss last year we probably had it in 2022 as well that's progress baby play on footy says blues losing to the pies and swans for getting to turn up has been shocking uh the blues losing was not a shock i changed my tip to Collingwood at the last minute thank you anthony from buys footy and uh sydney losing by 112 was a shock we will get to that Jaden Loader, this season currently reminds of 2006, where top four teams may be non-Victorians come finals. We haven't seen this type of interstate dominance since the early mid-2000s, and I believe this could be the year it happens. I'd say Lions versus Freo Grand Final could happen at this rate. I don't know if this was posted before Fremantle lost, which is not a big deal because I think Essendon played well. It was a great game, but when you consider the top four race, they probably do need to finish top four, and they finished the round in sixth, I think. But yeah, nice to see a little bit of a change up in the league. It's been like a 20-year cycle at this point points. Uh, 2006 was a good year uh, for Eagles fans. 2024 is, is bleak in comparison. G-Bag says LDU is a top 10 mid in the comp and we may never see a 400 game player after Pendles who might be the greatest magpie apart from Coventry. So LDU, yeah, he's 25, really coming into his own. Well, I think there's more comments on LDU coming, but I've been a big fan for a while. Picking apart a top 10 uh, midfielders list in the comp is difficult though. There's a lot of very good midfielders around the league, but you know, he's 25, he's starting his prime. As for Pendlebury, probably when you consider contribution, you know, Geelong talk about their best ever player. I mean, they've got the Ablets, but in terms of a player who has contributed, Selwood is probably theirs. Pendlebury, you know, again, I think Kane Corns made a really good point. Maybe his best isn't on the level of, say, Nathan Buckley's best. But over the stretch of his career, the contribution, yeah, he's been unreal. Um, I don't really know too much about Coventry personally, being a relatively young man. Santos El Harper, Santos El Harper says, Lions versus Port Granny. Wouldn't there be a certain irony to that where Collingwood versus Brisbane was a 20-year anniversary? Lions versus Port Adelaide in a grand final would also be a 20 year anniversary. That bodes well for Sydney and West Coast in 2025 and 2026. All right, let's get into the round. So it started off with the Bulldogs in Melbourne and uh, this one went fairly predictably. The Bulldogs are one of the hottest teams of the competition and Bontempelli is the best player in the competition in my opinion. I've been saying that for a while. He was absolutely unreal. Uh, but yeah, this was one-sided and it, it just trended with the way the teams are trending at the moment. The Demons had no answer for Bont and Pelly. Um, you know, Waitman was also really good in this game and it was pretty one-sided from the off. And, you know, the Bulldogs missed a lot of shots at goal. It could have been much uglier. And, you know, they were shrugging off Melbourne tackles left, right and centre and could have won by more. And I do think Melbourne's season is, well, it's completely over now, I would suggest. 35 scoring shots to 14 speaks to that dominance. And, uh, you know, I think it's probably, you know, this is just echoing what people are saying out in the media at the moment. But I do think there's an argument to just put your players on ice and start thinking about how you can experiment with the list over the last month. I know they've got a lot of injuries, but I think this season has come and gone for them. And it's probably time to hit the draft. I'm not saying the window's over but it's probably time to hit the draft. Let's look at some comments. 
Shadow Light says the Bulldogs are primed, set, and ready for finals. Melbourne not making finals can be a blessing. So agreed. So the Bulldogs are probably the second best team in it behind the Brisbane Lions at the moment and can still mathematically finish as high as third. I did a ladder predictor, um, you know, after this weekend of results because they were, had a few unexpected results. So it just changes the finals race completely. And the Bulldogs can f- finish third. And if they do, they have a good chance to make it all the way. Melbourne not making finals can be a blessing. I kind of agree. I mean, they've drafted well in recent years. They took two first rounders last year. And I think they can add to that this year. What well, they might end up with a pick six or seven at this current point. Not sure exactly where that will sit, but um, you know, a good chance to add another good young player. And I still think their window's open, but agreed, you get plays into surgery, get them ready for the preseason next year, and you never know what could happen. G Bag says the bomb might go down as the greatest bulldog ever and best to never win a Brownlow. Well, he could still win the Brownlow this year. I'm not too sure. Dacos is also a very big contender, but yeah, he's the best Bulldog player I've ever seen. Um, you know, I'm trying to think who are the best Bulldogs players I've seen in my time. I mean, the names that come to mind are Luke Darcy, um, Chris Grant, didn't he almost win a Brownlow? Libertore did win a Brownlow, Libertore Senior, that is, and uh, Scott West. My Bulldogs history knowledge is not that good, but he'd have to be the best Bulldog ever. Miss Kiri Lee also says Bulldogs can win the flag. Yeah, like I said, um, you know, if they finish as high as third, which at the moment I see that as the way this season is going to go, top four means that they are a good chance to at least play in a grand final. That is that how good their form is, but you know, don't trust the form lines too hard because things have changed quickly over the last four to six weeks of this season and they could change again. Let's move to the surprisingly much better Friday night game in terms of a contest. West Coast pulling off a thrilling win over the Gold Coast Suns, pipped them at the post. And it was a very satisfying win for a fan of a team who has not won in 11 weeks or 10 weeks or something like that. Good game of footy. Really good game of footy. And, um, you know, the couple of clutch goals really made it a spectacle. And it was nice to see Optus Stadium rocking again. The Eagles won four games at home this year and winless away. And speaking of winless away, that streak continues for the Gold Coast Suns. If I had to summarize this game briefly, I've done a whole review on the True Eagle channel, but I think the difference between the two sides, first of all, West Coast were better in the contest, and I felt Gold Coast were just a little bit more fumbly. West Coast were a little bit cleaner in a game that was decided by 10 points. That was the difference in the end. Uh, we'll highlight as well a couple of youngsters. As much as the senior players played well, it was good to see Ruben Ginnaby play his best game for the year. Harvey Johnston played really well. Jack Williams also played a career best game. So... Things are not as bleak as they once seemed at West Coast over the last 10 weeks in terms of at least seeing progress from youth, which has been a bit of a time between drinks since we could say that. All right, we've got heaps of comments on this one. Pull Your Head In says, a West Coast win on a Friday night was a perfect start to the weekend I haven't had for a while. Yeah, it's weird having a game early. Normally, we're one of the last games on a Sunday. Sean Christie says, finally, West Coast wins in a style that we can replicate and adapt for different opponents. Ford's going back appears to be a thing now. Yeah, that's one thing I'll say as well. I, um, you know, I didn't expect us to play with that ferocity again. I thought we'd be zapped. Danny Dark says, extremely happy with the Eagles. Been such a rough season for them after Simo got the sack and all the media scrutiny they copped. Dodged a 10-game loss streak with full class. Well said, well said. I'm glad we didn't get to 10. What did we get to last year? Is it like 16? Yeah, but nonetheless, it is, it is just nice to have a win again. Max Hansen says, Harry Edwards lost 28 games consecutively. In the 29th game where he finally breaks his losing streak, he gets concussed and only played 25% of game time. Yeah, unlucky. Um, I actually do think I remember his debut against the Cats in 2020. If I'm not mistaken, he got concussed in that game as well. I think that was his first game. Man, talk about rough luck. He's barely been able to sing the song, at least, you know, while fully conscious. Official Coast Club says, my takeaway is Eagles for the 2025 flag. Agreed, that's all but confirmed now. Then we got a couple of perspectives from Suns fans. So, Atzla says, as a Suns fan, it'll be interesting to see both the Richmond and Essendon games to see how much more poorly perform against the same teams we faced at home, but away instead. At home, the Suns beat North by 68, beat West Coast by 37, but away lost to North and an away loss to West Coast. That's a good point. The optimist within me is dead after this round. I can't see us magically solving this away game problem for the last three rounds that has plagued us the whole season. Zelmazam says, Gold Coast lose away from home again. Nothing new here, but West Coast played good. I thought they might have used all their energy on Frio. Yeah, like I said, West Coast have played a pretty aggressive and, and high-pressure style for a few, or well, three out of the last four games. And, um, you know, I'm surprised that they were able to replicate that again. But on Gold Coast, it's an interesting one. I think they got a good version of West Coast, which is unlucky. And I think West Coast sniffed a kill. And unlike the previous two good games we played against Fremantle and against Brisbane, 
West Coast would have refused to give this game up. And that was just Gold Coast bad luck. I don't think it was their best game by any stretch. But who have they got? I think they got Richmond at the MCG or Marvel. And they got Essendon. I think it's Richmond at the G and Essendon at Marvel. There's a chance they beat Richmond. I'm not sure about Essendon at this point, but there's a chance they beat Richmond. Again, it's a tough one, but that is something to aim for for the rest of the season. We got a few comments on the North versus Richmond game again as well, which I think was 13 points in the end. The shining lights for this season continue to, to shine bright again for North Melbourne here with Larky kicking five. Jackson Archer was really good again as well. Tristan Cherry is putting together an unbelievable season. Along with Jake Waterman, I, I think Jake, Tristan Cherry might be the most surprising breakout player, not because it's a surprise that he broke out, but the extent to which he's broken out being not that well known to an unbelievable player. And I think, you know, was it a few years ago, he was nearly traded to St. Kilda. LDU, fantastic. She's all unreal again. And uh, North pretty much just about consigned Richmond to a wooden spoon. We've got a few comments, that, so I'll just move straight to those. Tiger Walker says Richmond are winning the spoon. That's pretty much locked in now. It's hard to imagine Richmond winning two games and making up a bit of percentage on West Coast. Who knows? Flagaroo says North might not have the wins to call this year a huge progress, but let me run you through some things. North went into this year with a net loss of a 1,000 games experience. That's a good point. North didn't have a registered Ruckman and now have Cherry, who's bound for AA. Guys like Archer, Combin, Powell, Sheasel, Wardlaw, McKercher, Dersma, Curtis have taken huge steps. The future is bright. There is a huge contrast to what's happened at North Melbourne this year compared to the last two years in terms of optimism and young guys playing well, players breaking out. Even though if you look at wins and losses, it's pretty much the same. They won two games in 22, three in 23, and now they've just won their third, and I think are a good chance to go one step further and beat West Coast next week. But yeah, huge progress, and it's who's driving that progress as well, which is the really encouraging thing. Party Pasco says, Harry Sheasel being ran with the whole game and still had a huge impact. Crazy, this kid's 19. He, he says, North didn't play their best, but still got the job done. That's progress. We no longer have to play out of their skin to win games, and Harry Sheasel beat a hard tag on it at 19. Well said. Sheasel's a freak. He's he's on this day cost and you know, potentially Harley Reid level of just being... Just built different. Harvey says, Archer is North's most underrated young player. I agree. He has been fantastic this year and kind of come from nowhere. And, um, you know, similar to some other father-sons around the league, went pretty late in the draft, if I'm not mistaken. Was he a rookie first? I actually don't remember that part. But yeah, one of a few players they've unearthed this year. Leo King says, if North Melbourne win around eight games next year, LDU will win the Brownlow. Potentially, eight wins is still not a lot in terms of winning the Brownlow. Um, I wonder what the lowest spot a player has, you know, finished in, in terms of their ladder position and won the Brownlow. We move over to Geelong versus Adelaide, which didn't get as many comments, um, but this was another pretty good game, uh, particularly when Rochelle kicked that goal late to make it five points with, I don't know, less than a minute to go. I thought a massive scare was on the cards again. I think Adelaide have put two pretty good performances at GMHBA together in a row. And just continuing the topsy-turvy season, last week they got smashed by Hawthorne, this week they uh, had a really good response, and I think they can take something from that. Equally for Geelong, you know, I, they keep winning, and I don't think they're winning well, but, you know, I think when you've got just match winners in that team, you just can't discount them. And, and Jeremy Cameron is the best example of a match winner, or one of the best examples in the league. He's an unreal player, kicks six goals. You could see the relief on their faces when the Cats won that game, and they continue this run of form. And, you know, the way the season's going, you just accumulate these wins, and you put yourself in a chance to be there in September, and we'll, we'll see what happens with Geelong. On the downside, Sam Ducone may have done a knee, well, he's definitely done a knee injury, and we're just awaiting scans on that. So that could be big, because it's not just this year that could affect that. It'd be next year, too. Shadow Light says, valiant effort by the Crows. Cats claw the win to stay in top four contention. Again, it doesn't feel like the Cats are a top four team, but they're winning games, you know, and if this isn't the best version of them and they're winning games, then, you know, come September with an experienced best 22, who knows what could happen, particularly if they get a double chance. Collingwood versus Carlton, man, this game is crazy. So there's... There was two crazy Saturday night games for different reasons, and I found myself flicking between the two. I wanted to see the Sydney annihilation, annihilation out of pure fascination and bewilderment. And Collingwood versus Carlton was an unreal game as well. I changed my tip to Collingwood at the last minute, and thankfully I did, but it went right down to the siren with Mitch McGovern, you know, shanking that kick. Um, you know, the one thing that gets lost is that Carlton did come back from like four goals down. What was the margin? 32 points down, three minutes into the fourth quarter. So they did leave their run a little bit late. I just had a feeling Collingwood would lift for this game. And they, they do tend to lift for uh, you know the occasion, even though their run of form and the stats profile of the last five weeks for Collingwood has been horrendous. But nonetheless, they pulled it out. It did come at the cost of Jordan Dugowie, but Pendlebury, the great man, had 27 touches, nine clearances in his 400th game. That's unreal. But oh man, it's just disrupted this finals race once again. And Collingwood... 
I, I said in my finals preview with Jeruzzi, I was like, I'm just about ready to rule them out. Uh, but they just keep themselves in it. And also the effect it's had on Carlton. So Carlton were 11-4 and four and, you know, close to second at that point of the season. That was at the end of June. And now they sit in eighth position. I think they'll play finals still, but my God, they might have blown the double chance. Max Hansen says Charlie Kerner kicked at least one goal in 66 consecutive games. His streak ended against Collingwood kicking 0-2. Richo the Cat says Carlton are going to miss the eight, hopefully not as a Carlton supporter, but I can see it happening now. I think they'll get there. I did a ladder predictor and I, you know, I had Hawthorne beating them next week, but I still had Carlton finishing in eighth spot. But again, you get one of those predictions wrong and the whole thing's thrown out. Magpies 2 also points out Billy Frampton ended Kerno's 66-game streak. And Ms. Curie Lee says, Carlton and Collingwood cannot play a sensible game. Heart attacks all around. It's true. What is with this? I think this might have become the best rivalry in footy at the moment. I do think it ebbs and flows. I think if you're in Melbourne and in that, that environment, you probably do acknowledge that Carlton and Collingwood has always been a fierce rivalry, but it hasn't always been super relevant. It just feels more and more right now that they deliver more so than any other rivalry. Then we move to the shellacking that happened on Saturday night. This was crazy. So I was watching the Carlton Collingwood game and I was like, oh yeah, Port's playing Sydney. That'll be interesting. I tip Sydney. When was the last time you got your tip wrong by 112 points? <laughs> anyway. I checked the score and it was 64 nil. And I was like, are you serious? So I flicked it over and, and the annihilation continued a little bit longer. It got to 71 before Sydney put a score on the board and that was a rush behind as well. I have never seen such an incredible capitulation. So in the first quarter, Sydney were trailing 20 inside 50 to five and they had a forward half kicking efficiency of 0%. What the hell? Port Adelaide's now third. Biggest loss in John Longmire's 13-year tenure as coach. The Swans have lost eight in a row against the power now, which I didn't realize was the case. It was just an absolute shellacking, and I don't know what's the bigger takeaway. I think you give credit to Port Adelaide for being good enough to annihilate a team that's off, and it also is off the back of a pretty good run of form. They beat Carlton in Melbourne last week. I do think the bigger narrative here is Sydney, and I don't think premiership teams play like that, which is not a groundbreaking you know, observation, but I mean... I thought, you know, they really get through this form slump, but this loss has really thrown that into chaos, and I know that Sydney fans are feeling that at the moment. There's still a win clear on top, which is the absolutely bizarre aspect of this. We'll get to the comments. Shadow Light says, Lightning doesn't strike twice, unless you're a Swans fan. In that case, Lightning strikes 112 times. Top two in serious threat to Sydney. Look, I like Sydney, and I kind of do want them to win the flag, but they have dished out so much humiliation to West Coast over the last, really the last three years, but they've really dominated us since about 2008. AFL snaps, so Sydney losing by 100 points this late into a season. Don't think they can mentally recover from something like that. Shades of West Coast, 2021 to 2023. I agree the similarities. West Coast in 2021 were not top spot and looking distantly first, obviously. But they were eight and five and sitting seventh and had just beaten Richmond and then just turned into a completely different team. And I am reminded of that a little bit. Like, we're talking serious losses. West Coast lost two games by 90-plus that year, and that would foreshadow what would happen for the next three or whatever it's been. Sydney, I don't think, are going to fall off that hard, but it's hard to see them recovering to really be a threat in September at this point. I could be wrong. Callum Williams says, the carbon monoxide detectors in Adelaide's away rooms are not working properly. Oh, my God. That's dark, but it made me laugh. LD Sports says, I was sitting there watching the Port Swans game in disbelief the whole night. I was right there with you, mate. Papley lives rent-free in your head, says, this is not a matter of being figured out. Teams took away our corridor earlier in the year, and we did just fine. To concede the way we did feels like there's something internal going on at the Swans. Never seen the Swans play this poorly, and the first 16 weeks look like the best Sydney side I've ever seen. Yeah, I mean, I feel for you. This is such a brutal, emotional roller coaster of a season for a Swans fan. I agree, this was probably the best Sydney I had ever seen. That performance against Port Adelaide might be the worst, at least, game I've ever seen Sydney play. But broadly, I agree, this is not a tactical thing. This is not an injury thing. I mean, injuries have occurred. I know they're missing Papley, but would Papley have kicked a goal against Port Adelaide? I'm not sure. Pixel Knight says the Swans are cooked. They have lost the second highest margin this year. They lost by 112 and the Tigers by 119. The next closest loss is 99 by West Coast. Still haven't lost by 100, baby. Although we do play Carlton and Geelong to end the season. Jaden Lotus says, take away from the Sydney game. Really piss poor performance from the Swans. However, despite their terrible form slump over the last month and with injuries, I'm still backing the Swans to beat the Pies at the SCG. Will they claim top spot? Who knows? Very difficult to tell who's going to win the flag this year. City's percentage is also in deep, deep trouble. They went from 136.5 to 127. 
I think they'll be okay on the percentage front, provided this doesn't continue. 127 is still would be the best in the league. I think the Bulldogs and Freeman are pretty good with the percentage. I'm not sure if I'm going to tip City against Collingwood. We'll get to that in just the tips, but my God. All right, let's move to another great game. There were two great Sunday games. GWS overcame a 28-point deficit to clinch victory from the jaws of defeat against Hawthorne, who kind of... You know, it was a good performance. I actually kind of wanted both teams to win. I want both teams to feature in finals, but GWS were just too good. Jesse Hogan kicks five goals, possibly going to win the Coleman now. Who knows? It's still a pretty tight race on that front. But, you know, first half felt like Hawthorne's pressure really hemmed in GWS's ball movement, which has been their strength, and that sort of broke in the second half. GWS got a little bit more daring. I thought Brent Daniels was very impactful in this game, sort of rolled up to stoppages. GWS ended up winning the clearances despite missing guys like Kelly and Canelio. Uh, just a great game of footy, to be honest. You know, I think Hawthorne still played well. Um, you know, their, their blend of contested footy as well as their outside speed and class and their ability to hurt you is very striking about this Hawthorne team. And they're still going to potentially make finals. Who knows? This was probably a game they needed to win, but we'll see. Just the one comment on this game, Toby Green, Jesse Hogan, the best forward line duo in the comp. Yeah, like I said, you, you also include uh, Brent Daniels. Um, Callum Brown had a great start to the season. Cadman's also kicked 20 goals now, which is pretty good. Is he a second-year player? He's a second-year player. So a very high-level talent bubbling away at GWS. Let's talk about Essendon and Fremantle. This one, subverted expectations. I was very confident Fremantle would win whilst equally not wanting to write off Essendon as hard as everyone else. But I, w I didn't think Fremantle would drop this game. Nonetheless, it produced a great game of footy. The Bombers were down by 25 points early in the last quarter. Steamed home, if that's the right word. But even in just like the dying seconds, you know, if you didn't watch this game, go watch the last two minutes. But Jai Amos kicks a goal, levels the score at 89 all, 36 seconds to go, and Zach Merritt gets a ball out of the center. Sam Durham, I think it was, kicks the point. Just an outstanding finish. And I was just really happy for Essendon to be able to just go against the narrative that's against them at the moment. And will they play finals? Well, they're still in the mix now. They're still like two points out of... Um, eighth spot and then now ahead of Hawthorne so I guess so but it was a quality game of footy Fremantle were very accurate they kicked 14-5 like some of their forwards don't miss I think Tracy kicked three Amos kicked four Jackson and Sturt kicked two it was just a good game of footy and heartbreaking for Fremantle fans who again you know it was looking like they were a genuine top two chance prior to this game especially with certain results falling their way and now they've lost as well. It just keeps throwing out these crazy results. So a double chance with, with some tough games to go in the season. Fremantle are now up against it to make the top four. So they got the Cats. I think they'll beat the Cats. They got the power at home. Now that's not looking as obvious as it did before with Port Adelaide playing good footy. And they've got GWS in Sydney, I think in the middle week. So the future's in their hands at Fremantle. We got one comment, Pickle Green guy says, Fremantle still struggle closing out games. I don't know if that's actually been a weakness, has it? I mean, they lost close games to Carlton and Port Adelaide. Um, then they've played in two draws since. So I don't know if you hold that against them. But I think their fitness and second halves have been okay. Um, this was just a good game of footy and Essendon charged home late. Then the round finished with one game, which um, I suppose was a bit of a fizzer, to be honest. Like, I didn't expect this result to be so one-sided with the form St Kilda are in, but they ended up going down by 85 points, I think, to the Brisbane Lions. Um, and I think this was just Brisbane flexing their muscle. And I think they can sense that this could be their year. I mean, they got close last year, but with teams just, like, capitulating one week and playing well the other, Brisbane have remained a constant. And they are very much a minor premiership chance. And just the contested ball is where they dominated this game. What was the stats? 138 to 97 plus 41 in contested ball is an absolute baking. The clearances were 48 to 27. McInerney gave their mids first service and they got in the Lockie Neal winning 13 clearances. Cam Rayner has also been a real value add in the second half of this season. Their depth is looking rock solid. This was just an absolutely bruising encounter. And St Kilda got a really bad reality check. Look, it's a bad performance. It's a bad performance in a very disappointing year, but it does come off the back of some improved form. So I think maybe some burnout, and they're coming up against a red-hot Brisbane Lions side that, you know, just not giving anyone an inch at the moment. Leo King says, we need to start talking about Lockie Neal's one of the best players this century. In two months, he could have three brown loads, a premiership, and maybe a Norm Smith. That's a fair point. I was actually thinking, like, he's still got to be a brown low chance. He's just sort of quietly doing his thing week in, week out. And, you know, a proven vote getter. There is a chance he wins three, and I don't know who else has won three before. I can think of a number of one, two, you know, five, Adam Goods and Lockie Neal, of course, uh, the three that I can think of since 2000. Oh, Judd and Ablett both won two, didn't they? So that's, that's pretty elite company, and he could elevate above them. Now, I don't think he's better than any of them, but in terms of achievement, 
he could have he could be one of the most decorated players ever. Coppo's Crow says Brisbane are best. I agree with that. They're the best team in the competition, but we are still, what are we out? We're about seven weeks removed from grand final day, maybe more. So there's a lot can play out, but things are just looking like they're just falling together for the Brisbane Lions, who could be minor premiers. What were they, 0-5? Were they 0-5? Crazy. Anyway, guys, that's all we got on the football come down. Um, it was a bit of a longer one, lots of comments. Thanks for your inputs. It is an exciting end of the season. I'm really enjoying it, even though my team's not relevant. It's been fun covering this season with you, and I'm looking forward to next week already. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.